topic because sometimes during your exams you might be asked to take a oral health survey if there are post graduates in this group uh, you might be asked to record a patient's details using this who performer uh, sometimes from the undergraduate point of view you might get a short note or probably an mcq uh, on this topic and also those who are preparing for post graduation if there is somebody who is preparing for post graduation you can definitely expect a few mcqs on this topic right so uh, before we start then let me just tell you that uh, today i'll be go, uh, i'll be superficially going through uh, the performa right uh, in some areas a little bit into detail but uh, of course due to time constraints we'll not be able to complete go into detail at each and every coding or uh, the condition that is there in this performa but like dr denzi said if you require any uh, further expansions i can uh, always give it to you you can just put in the chat box later on i can always share it with you so uh, the focus of today's lecture is going to be on two versions that is the 1997 and 2013 version of the who basic oral health survey so my the first slide i have tried to what i am trying to tell you is uh, what is basic oral health survey okay so it is a tool for assessing the current oral health status of a population okay so please read these words very uh, clearly it's a tool for assessing the oral health status of a population so that means to say that if you are going to undertake a survey of a population this is one of the tools that you could use okay so but it is just for practice that we use this in your clinical setup also or in during your public health dentistry training okay you all know at least and the undergraduates here would know like one of the scope of Uh, the subject called public health dentistry is to assess the oral health status of a population, especially in a community. Right. So this is a very important tool as far as recording that is concerned. So before I start, I just want to ask all of you, why is such a tool required? Okay. You can just use your chat box to uh, tell me your answers. Why do you think a tool is required for us to assess the oral health status? a standard tool like this why is it required you can put in your answers in the chat box survey purpose yes that's right it's comprehensive yes to collect basic information about oral health status yes any other answers it's time consuming time consuming for what if i can ask dr pallavi uh, do you i trying to say that the tool that we are going to use is time consuming less time consuming okay fine fine okay then there is an answer called planning yes good standardization of data collection yes universally accepted for comparison so this is exactly the reason why this tool has been developed you have told me almost all the answers right so i'll just go into the exact wordings of what who has told for bringing out such a tool they say that it is to assess the prevalence of oral disease yes that you have already told uh it requires standardization this is one of the most important aspect of developing this tool because if we want to have comparisons if we want to have worthy comparisons you need the disease to be measured equally across all countries right so this one tool would provide standardization for that then like somebody said it would help in program planning because once you know the burden of disease in a country or in a region you can definitely plan for programs or rather to put it more clearly before you plan for a program it is important that you understand what is the prevalence of dental diseases in that area for example if you are going to conduct a caries preventive program in an area where the problem is periodontal disease it's going to be a failure right so you need to first understand what is the prevalent oral health condition and accordingly it will help you to plan a program then of course once you plan a program and you implement the program to know whether your program has been successful you need to do it again you need to study the disease pattern again so if there is a difference if there is if the oral health disease burden has come down that is an indicator that your program is a success and of course all this will finally contribute to research uh, 
summarizing and for analyzing data. Most of you in a post-graduation might take up projects like assessing the oral health status of a particular community. Right? So if it is something like that, then it is useful for, if you're using this tool for something like that, then it is a research purpose. Okay. So before we go on to the two forms that we are going to focus on today, we, let's briefly see the evolution of these forms. The first edition was published way back in 1971, right? followed by a second edition in 1977, the third edition in 1987, the fourth edition in 1997, and the fifth edition, what you see on the right side of your screen, is in, was released in 2013. Why we are focusing on 97 and 2013 is because there are still uh, people do use 97 because uh, you'll come to know what at towards the end of the lecture you'll come to know why 97 is still in use and why people are not completely converted into 2019. So what 2013 sorry. So what I would like to say here is uh, at this point you need to understand that this is a proforma. Okay, it is a proforma for recording oral diseases. Right? So I'll be showing you the proforma initially. I'll just show you how the proforma looks for 1997 edition, then how it looks for 2013 edition. And then we will be speaking more about 2013, but I will make references to 99 edition whenever th there is a difference from the 2013 edition. Okay, So my focus is going to be on 2013, but any change will be mentioned. So this is how the 1997 edition work assessment performa actually looks. Okay, it is a, it's composed of four pages. This is the first page. Okay, it's something like your case history, but more related to uh, quantifying the disease burden. Okay, I am just running through this because we'll come back to it later. So these are the four pages of, of the 1997 version, and uh, I'll just quickly tell you what are the major differences between. In 1997 and 2013, you'll be able to appreciate it more once I complete the lecture. Okay, so in 1997, there was only one standardized form, which you just saw now. There were four pages, it was one standardized form. Whereas in 2013, there are five forms that are given that is, there are two forms for adults, two forms for children, and one form to assess the oral manifestations regarding HIV AIDS. And why I said two is because one form is for the tooth and one form will record even the surfaces of the tooth. Okay, I'll show you pictures of that as we go on. Then there are color plates. Color plates are there in 97 also, but in 2013 also. Uh, so whatever changes have been made from 97 edition, they have included the color plates for that in 2013 also. Then in 97 uh, edition, in addition to the common things, there were TMJ assessments, assessment of enamel op opacities using an DDE index, we'll come to that. Then they also assessed dentofacial anomalies using the dental aesthetic index. Whereas in 2013, TMJ was removed, the enamel opacities were, uh, were slightly modified to make it enamel hypoplasia and uh, dental dentofacial anomalies were also removed. And these two things were added in 2013 called dental erosion and dental trauma. Okay. A few other minor changes that happened is in 97, it was dentition status and treatment needs. Whereas in 2013, it is only dentition status. There was CPI index in 97 and it was slightly modified to call, to call it a CPI modified index in 2013. There was prosthetic status and prosthetic need in 97, whereas it was only dentures in 2013. Uh, the last part of the both the forms were regarding the intervention and referral. Okay, in 97, it was called need for immediate care and referral, whereas in 2013, it was called intervention urgency and treatment. Okay, so with this, we will go into the forms. Uh, sorry, before that, uh, I hope most of you are aware of this. WHO, sorry, yeah, uh, so let's go ahead, uh, uh, sorry ma'am, was that a question? Yeah, please continue Dr. Yeah, okay, so uh, the WHO proposes five age groups as index age groups, right? So index age groups means the WHO recommends to use this age group while you're doing the survey. 
you all know that these are the five index age groups or at least uh, because we are all in the public health dentist we have definitely come across this five age groups but what i want to ask you is why have these five age groups been chosen okay so why do you think five years is an index age group anyone you can either unmute or you can quickly put it into the chat box or uh, if that takes time probably i can just call out a few names you can tell the answers even if it's wrong it doesn't matter okay uh, madhu kiran can i uh, do you have an answer as to why five years has been used as a index age group anyone uh, you can just unmute and you can tell me the reason why yeah we have a couple of answers doc in the chat box Yeah. Sir, because uh, in five years all the primary teeth come. Yeah, so the primary teeth is usually there in the oral cavity by uh, five years, and also that is the time in which the caries there there could be a drastic change in the caries levels, right? So the molars could start to get decayed, and also more importantly, this is the time where usually in many countries the primary schooling will begin. so it is a time when you can get a group of students through schools a group of children through schools right so that is why 5 years or anybody can you tell why 12 years sir because it includes all permanent teeth except uh, third molars yes except third molars you have all the permanent teeth erupted and it is also an age where people usually leave the primary school right so it is a time it is the last point of time when you can get together get more people at a time in a school setting okay okay fine so that is why probably 12 years since primary since permanent tooth are there in the oral cavity and all have erupted it is also known as a global monitoring age for caries right okay why 15 years anyone why 15 years okay i'll tell why it is because it is because the tooth have been exposed for a for a sufficient amount of time in the oral cavity that is your primary molars would have been your permanent first molars would have been exposed for at least 9 years in the oral cavity and like that many of the tooth would have been exposed for quite some time so that any changes in disease pattern could be noted also it could be used for assessing any periodontal condition among adolescents that is why 15 years is a uh, uh, is indicated and 35 to 44 uh, there isn't much to think uh, you must to guess why this age has been included because the full effect of dental caries and periodontal disease among adults would be felt at this uh, age group and of course for 65 to 74 years uh, we all know that the shift that is happening we have more of uh, old age problems Uh, uh coming in so you have root caries and all such things periodontal disease gets progresses more during old age so to get a life course perspective and to study the geriatric oral health problems 65 to 74 years is taken as the next index age group okay so then depending upon if you are doing this on a large scale that is if you are doing it as a survey on a community or probably as a state wide survey or a country wide survey Uh, how do you sample the population that you are going to take? Here, it's going to be probability sampling. You all know what is probability sampling. I'm just going to tell those names for you to understand, and I've just put pictures for you to understand what it means. Uh, systematic random sampling is there, where you choose every nth number of the population. That is possible only when the population is small and it is defined. Then you have a stratified. random sampling where you split the people based on different homogeneous groups say probably your age groups you can split them and then you can sample from that then there is something called cluster sampling where you divide the population into different clusters and you randomly choose one or two clusters and then you uh, take everybody in that cluster and do the uh, do the assessment and sometimes there is also something called as probability proportional to size that is if you have one state has more population and one state has has less population you need to take more people from the other state and a little bit less from this state that is what is probability proportional to size okay, you don't have to bother much about this uh, and then there is something known as pathfinder survey okay pathfinder survey 
uh, is actually one of the methodologies that are usually used if you are doing a statewide or a national wide survey. And here the technique that they employ is slightly a mixture of both. That is a stratified cluster sampling is what is used. So they stratify first based, based on criteria and then they choose the clusters. So here what they do is they select the most important population group and then they choose the number of subjects in each age group. Okay, I'll tell you how they choose it. It is basically done for pilot or for national surveys. And usually, if it is a pilot survey, they take one or two index age groups only, of which 12 years has to be mandatory. Okay, so 12 year group, group you have to include because it's a global monitoring age, and then you can include any other age group of your choice. This is for pilot survey. Okay, so the sample size that they say is it's not that you have to strictly follow only this sample size, this is some of the minimum sample size that they are uh, recommending. Okay, if you're doing it on a statewide basis or in a uh, district wide basis, if you have an urban area, you need to select four sites in that particular capital city or the metropolitan area. And then you need to take at least 25 people from that group, which will constitute 100 people. Then if there are two large towns in that place, then you need to take two sites from those two large towns. So basically four sites, again with 25 people, it will take you to 100. And if you have rural areas in the state, then you need to select at least four villages from there and choose one site each. That will again take you to 100. So for one age group, you have a total of 300 subjects minimum. Okay. So then again, if you're going to take in a national survey, if you're going to take at least four index age groups, if not five, sometimes it might not be possible to take five because sometimes getting the age group of 15 and all could be difficult. So if you take at least four age groups, you will end up with a total sample of at least 1,200. Okay, so this is what is recommended. It is a minimum. You can always take more than that. That's not at all, in, not at all a problem. Okay, so coming to the instruments required, uh, you might know all this. You require a mouth mirror. You require a periodontal probe, you require a tweezer, you require a CPI probe, you require uh, instrument trays for, uh, please assume these things in the form of a field survey. Okay, when you're going to the community to do a survey, what all things do you need? That is what I'm trying to show here. Then you need disinfectant solution, you need, a, you, of course, you need a box of gloves, a portable wash basin, hand towels or tissue papers, and gauze. So this is the minimum armamentarium that you require if you are going to go out into the field and do the survey. Okay, then how do you examine? Okay, so when you, the most, the recommended position is to ask the patient to lie on a bench or a table and the examiner has to be seated behind, like you see in the picture. Okay, but if you have facilities to make the patient sit, or if you have a portable dental chair or something like that, if you have a chair with a high backrest, you can always do that. And the examiner could either stand behind or in front of the chair. If no furniture is available, it's highly unlikely, but still, if there's no furniture available, you need to ask the subject to lie on the ground with the examiner sitting cross-legged behind the person's head. Okay, all this will come into picture when you're going into, say, tribal areas or something like that. And lighting conditions, it is always recommended that you have a portable examination light. If that is not available, you will have to use a natural daylight, but position the patient in an area where you get maximum illumination. Okay, so this is the 2013 oral health assessment form, right? This is composed of two pages. You had seen four pages in 97, whereas here it is two pages. And let's quickly look at all the elements that are there. Most of the things are very self-explanatory, so I'll not be spending much time on that. Okay, so for example, the top part says this. Okay, it is something called the date that you're doing the survey. That is date of examination. There's nothing much to explain in that. Then there is an identification number where you need to give a code for each patient. Okay, so if you're expecting uh, numbers in thousands, then the first patient you would write as 0001. That is, the number of digits should be the uh, should be the same as the total number of patients that you're expecting in the survey. If you're expecting only 100 patients, then your scoring would start from 0, 0, 001, right? Then there is original or duplicate. Why this is important is sometimes to check yourself, whether to validate your own uh, observations, we might take two times, we might take the assessment of the same patient twice. 
probably say today morning and today evening so that will tell you whether your whether any change is happening as time progresses okay so it is for that reason they are asking to tell whether it is original or duplicate if it is the first time you are doing it give it one after that give it as two three four you can give if you are taking the second copy of the same person give it two if you are taking third copy of the same person do it make it as three right that is basically for inter examiner reliability sometimes what happens is just to know whether what you are doing is right or wrong another person might take the same uh, patient and score okay that you do all this before you start the main survey in the pilot survey to know whether you are doing it properly that time also you can mark this as one or two etc then examiner if if you are doing a, a large survey and you have so many examiners each examiner should be given a code and that code you can write in there okay so this was the first part and the second part contains of quite uh, uh, easily understandable information one is the name again it has to be written in block letters but sometimes we don't usually collect the names when we do a survey at that point you can leave it blank some countries might not allow identification through name so you may leave it blank but still you always have a code for the patient in the previous section then you will write the gender which is male or female then there is date of birth in the dd mm yy format you have to actually take the at the last birthday what was his age okay that is how you need to mark the age age at the last birthday for example if my birthday was in january if today i am getting the survey done you have to write the age which was there in my last birthday that means if my say for example uh, my birthday is in january and you are doing the survey in december don't count that year because you have to write it when what was my age in the previous jan yeah okay so that is how you need to mark the age then there are few topics called ethnic group other groups years in school and occupation ethnic group actually can vary okay it depends upon where you are doing the survey it could be based on so different countries categorize ethnic groups based on different factors sometimes it could be based on area or a country of origin sometimes the ethnic group could be categorized based on race sometimes based on color sometimes based on language sometimes based on religion so it is something which is kept open depending upon your setting you can take a call on how the ethnic group is going to be so probably what you can do is you can make a code early on earlier on before you start the survey and say that i am going to choose religion as my ethnic group so for example in our department especially for training purposes we decide to write since we collect the information called religion in our case history we have decided to put religion as the ethnic group and you give a code for the religion say 01 means hinduism 02 means islam 03 means christianity like that okay but if the country has some specific directions you can always use that then there is other groups that means if you have any further sub classification to do you can make codes all these are left open for the investigators to decide there is no hard and fast rules for these then years in school again it is for you to know the educational status how many years has the person spent in school and coming to occupation again the who does not give you a criteria because each country has its own uh, way of classifying occupation okay so for india it is different say for us it might be different so depending upon the local context you can give a classification for occupation right so the next area is something called community and location again self explanatory community is again left open for you to prepare a code if you are going to deal with different communities maybe based on geographic location or something like that you can make a code if there is nothing just write 99 if you don't have any sub communities in your survey just write as 99 and location again is self explanatory where you you need to tell whether it is an urban area peri urban area or a rural area and accordingly accordingly you can give the code as 1 2 and 3 and one place called or three headings called other data is left blank okay that is again dependent on local context but the only thing is it must be planned prior to the survey okay so if you want to uh, include uh, say special groups or something like that you can uh special children or special groups or tribal groups you can use that in other data then it tells you about extra oral examination okay extra orally if you find any visible abnormality you need to write here so they have given the code of it in the box here that is the first box depends on condition and the second box depends on location okay so the most prominent abnormality you can write for example if there is an ulceration in the neck or the face or something like that you need to put a score of 1 and 1 
that will tell you the oil that is what is known as extra, extra oral examination so this form actually contains these codes also so it is not necessary you need to by heart all these things because you can always look back at the uh, forms and right because this is meant for oral health surveys okay when you go into the field and collect data for national level data collectors this is meant for that so they always need to have a ready reckoner and this forms provides the codes also okay so a small change that was there in 97 form as i mentioned was temporomandibular joint assessment okay so here what they did is they had a box which says symptoms signs there are two boxes symptom if there is no symptom write zero if there is any symptom related to tmj you can write one and sign they are uh, they are going to ask about clicking tenderness and reduced jaw mobility okay if any of these thing is there put as one else you put it as zero okay but please note that this was there only in the 97 form it has been removed from the 2013 form the next part or rather the most important part i would uh, request you to pay attention here is the dentition status okay dentition status is something a little bit above what we usually take is something known as dmft okay you all know what is dmft index you routinely record that in your case histories so this is a little bit more uh, you all know the limitations of dmft also so it, with that basis dentition status is much more uh, explained okay so you have the codes given here on the right side of the form and each tooth you have to code for the crown and the root okay so they have also given you what are the numericals that you use to code the crown and root okay so it's not very difficult but i would say that you might not get it in one look you might have to read it twice or thrice because there are a few subtle differences when you code particular kind of teeth okay so uh, definitely this figure is going to help you while coding these teeth uh, i have just put the scores for each of the tooth i will just i am not going to show this now i'll just finish the form and in case we need to uh, anybody needs this in detail we can always come back to it okay so these are the codes for each of these teeth as to how it is there but most of it when you know the names for example a tooth which is carious you know a tooth which is carious has to be recorded by what number okay so with that i am just skipping this yeah i have just kept as optional okay so coming to 97 form in 97 form what there was a slight difference from what we do in 2013 if you look at it more or less it looks similar but there is one extra row here known as treatment needs okay so based on the crown and root score you can sort of advise a treatment and that treatment is what had to be written in the box at the below but since the treatments have advanced quite drastically since there are a lot of new treatments sometimes this has sort of become obsolete so that is why in 2013 it is only crown and root status because treatment can be different because before we used to say that if it is root stump we need to extract but now you know that even root stumps can be saved right saved and rehabilitated so because of that reasons it's not easy for us to just limit all our treatments to just these few codes so that is why that option has been removed from the form the next aspect of uh, 2013 form which comes in the bottom of the first page is something known as cpi index which is modified okay modified in the sense the number of codes have been reduced and they have included two aspects in cpi modified which includes bleeding and pocket so this is basically for us to assess the periodontal condition okay uh, this is quite simple to do as in gingival bleeding you all know to probe your probe the gingival sulcus and after probing the sulcus if you feel that if you see that there is bleeding put the score of 1 if there is no bleeding put the score of 0 okay and if you are not able to do the probing for some reason you can always write as tooth is excluded okay and if the tooth is missing put a score of x similarly for pocket you need to see if it is zero that means it's absence of condition if it is one it is a pocket of 4 to 5 mm if it is two the pocket of 6 mm or more and 9 and x is as told before okay so i'll just show a visual representation of that gingival scores after you probe if there is no bleeding from there you can call it score zero which is absence of condition if there is a bleeding that is happening it is presence of condition and you use a 
probe, a CPI probe. And if you see that there is, you can completely see the black mark on the CPI probe, which is from 3.5 to 5.5 millimeter, then you say that is absence of condition. If only the upper end of black mark is visible, that means it is almost extending up to four to five millimeter, that is the pocket. And if you don't see the black band, that means there is more than six millimeter pocket. So that is why a CPI probe is used and not a Russell spedontal probe for this condition. Okay, because it, it enables us in easy identification of the uh, condition of the pocket. Uh, as the, if you have any doubts, you can please put in the chat box. I'll get back to it at the end of the session. Okay, so when you turn to the next page, the first thing that you see is loss of attachment. Okay, you all know the difference between uh, a pocket and a loss of attachment, right? You would have studied this in video and we're going much into that. So when you, uh, and you would have also understood that loss of attachment is a more reliable indicator of pedontal disease compared to pedontal pocket. Because pedontal pocket sometimes could just be due to false pockets also you can have false gingival enlargements which will increase the pocket depth because pocket depth is calculated from the tip of the gingival margin to the base of the surface. Okay, so if your gingiva is enlarged due to some reason, your uh, depth can increase and it could lead, lead to erroneous measurements. Whereas in loss of attachment, it is from the uh, symmetry enamel junction to the base of the surface. So it will exactly tell you whether there is pedontal uh, detachment or not. So again, for loss of attachment, you need to see the six teeth of CPI, which are known as the index teeth. That is 17 or 16, 11, 26 or 37, 46 or 47, 31 and 36 or 37. Okay. You can also see this using the CPI probe and this is how you usually uh, mark them. Okay, so depends upon where your gingival, gingival position is. Okay, if you have any doubts on this, you can refer back to the CPI uh, index that will that shows shows you the same picture, and you will know whether how deep is the loss of attachment here. Because in pocket, above six is recorded in one score, whereas here you have a scoring for six to eight, nine to eleven, and twelve twelve or more. Because you know that there are two types of CPI probes. One is clinical probe and one is epidemiological probe. In uh, clinical probe, you have a scoring of 3.5, 5.5, 8.5, and 11.5, right? So if it goes beyond the 11.5 millimeter ring, that means that it is severe parental destruction and you can give a score of four, okay? Then the next section is known as enamel fluorosis, okay? In enamel fluorosis, they use the Dean's index for recording the score. Okay, so here again, uh, the criteria is given here. You, they also have given you certain plates at the end of the book. Okay, this is a manual. They've given you color photographs as to how each of these conditions would look. Okay, so you have scores ranging from zero to nine, where zero to five is regarding the fluorosis and eight and nine is when you have to exclude a tooth or when you're not able to record a particular tooth. Okay, so you can just refer back to the Dean's fluorosis index for you to understand how, how the scoring is done. Uh, but a few things that you need to note while you uh, do enamel or while you record fluorosis is that you need to differentiate it with other non-fluoride opacities, okay? It could be a little bit difficult because fluorosis, again, you, you might, you should be able to see them only, more of them only in endemic areas. And uh, there could be non-fluoride opacities like hypoplasia and early caries and all that. So you differentially diagnose it if you want to read more about that, there is something called results criteria, which will tell you how to differentiate between fluoride and non-fluoride opacities. Then uh, you need to take, if you look at the box here, enamel fluorose has only one box, right? So you can write only one score there. So how do you choose which score to write? For that, you need to make, check all the tooth and the coding is done based on the two most severely affected tooth. Okay, that means if two scores have the same score of say four and four, then four is the score that has to be given. But if there is four and three, then the score that you have to give is three. That is the score based on the less affected tooth is what you have to give, okay? Then, so what they recommend is you have to start from the highest score, that is from five, is there pitting? If pitting is not there, okay, come to four. Then look at the criteria for four. If four is not there, eliminate that, come to three. So that is how you need to score. That is the recommended 
way to score for enamel fluorosis. Okay, so if you have a doubt, you also have to assign a lower score. For example, if you have confusion between one and two, then the score you need to assign is because it says that one is twenty-five percent and two is fifty percent. Right. So when there's such such a minute differences are there, or where there could be subjective differences, it is better to assign the lower score. Okay. Uh, like I told you, another change that was there in ninety-seven form was it was called as not fluorosis, rather it was called as enamel opacity. And the index that was used to record this was known as developmental defects of enamel or DDE index. And for that, there was only ten index tooth. That is from the upper quadrant from one four to two four, and the lower quadrant three six and four six. And we don't use this very often now, but I just put this for completion purpose. And the codes and criteria have been given here. Okay. The next aspect that is there in 2013, but is not there in uh, 97, is called dental erosion. Okay, I am just putting a few pictures to show you what is dental erosion. This is score zero, where you don't obviously find any sign of erosion here. But if you look at it here, the slightly dentin seems exposed. Okay, so a lot of yellowish discoloration you can see there, where the underlying dentin is exposed. That you can say as it's an enamel lesion. Then. The erosion is quite clear here, where you can even see the dentin involved. So it's a dentinal lesion, whereas you might see things like this, which is completely. This might not be due to attrition, but could be due to erosion, where pulp is also involved. Then you need to give a score of three, and you also need to write how many teeth. That is the severity or the burden for knowing the how much is the burden in that particular individual. You need to write how many teeth were affected because of erosion. Okay. The next aspect, which is there in 2013, but not in 97, is dental trauma. Okay, dental trauma again, it's not very difficult. There are criteria for that. So this is score one, where there is uh, only an enamel. Sorry, this is score two, where there is only an enamel fracture, and score three is the second picture, where there is enamel and dentin fracture. Then there is score four, which involves the fracture, which involves the pulp also, and score five is. Where you have a missing tooth due to trauma. Okay, so a score one is something which has been treated. That is, you have an anterior fracture which has been restored by composite. Then you need to write the score as one. Okay, again, this also contains a box for number of teeth affected. Then the next aspect that is there in both the forms is oral mucosal lesions. The only thing I would like to tell here is it's not very easy for us to identify what type of lesion it is because uh, it could uh, it is important for us to identify it, to properly retract and examine this because you first of all you are doing it in a community setting you might not have all the paraphernalia all the lights and that much uh, what do you call that uh, that much any aids any diagnostic aids extra in your hand all you have is just a natural daylight and your mouth mirrors and cheek retractors. So all what you can have is you can use either two plain mouth mirrors to retract the oral cavity, retract the cheeks, or you can use a mouth mirror and the handle of a periodontal probe to retract it. And then you need to look for these conditions. Okay, but again you need to be very uh, careful when you record these conditions because it starts from oral cancer. Okay, or you write this only if it's very obvious. Okay. Uh, and again, uh, the first corner, uh, the first box is based for the condition, and the second set of boxes is for the location. For example, if you have a leukoplakia in the buccal mucosa, then you need to give a score of two here and a score of four here. If the patient also has a lichen planus, you need to give a score of three. If that is also in the buccal mucosa, give a score of four. Okay. If he has an uh, ulceration, uh, probably an aphthous ulcer in the gingiva. Then you need to give a score accordingly, or the buccal mucus, or the lips anywhere. You need to give a score accordingly. Okay. So take the most important three lesions that you find on the patient's oral cavity and then record them. And the next aspect is the dentures. It's quite simple. Just two boxes. One is upper, one is lower. If there is a partial denture, give a score of one. If it is a complete denture, give a score of two. Else, give a score of zero for the upper and lower. It was a little bit more complicated in ninety-seven form, where it was prosthetic status and need was the title that was given for that. And you can just have a look at it. I'm not going to go into detail of that. There are codes given, and you can uh, always uh, 
uh, write the codes accordingly. But if you look at it, there are no implants here, right? So because all that happened only a bit later in 97, that was not probably very, uh, not a routine procedure. That is why all these things have been changed. Then in 97, the another thing which is there is dentofacial anomalies, uh, which is not there in 2013. And this was done using the DAI or Dental Aesthetic Index. Okay, so Dental Aesthetic Index, uh, it's again, it's based on the space that is there between the tooth, the diastema that is there. So basically with regard to malocclusion, this is what we are trying to record in dentofacial anomalies. Okay. And the last part of the form is something known as intervention urgency. This is the 2013 form that I'm talking about. Based on your observation of the oral health status, you can sort of decide what type of treatment is required, not specifically, but overall. Okay. If it is only preventive or routine treatment, give a score of one. If it is a prompt treatment that is, which has to be done without much delay, that is called prompt treatment, which includes scaling also, give a score of two. But if it is something where the patient is having an abscess or, uh, or is in severe pain due to infection, it is called urgent treatment or immediate treatment, give a score of three. And if you have any systemic conditions, if you feel that a lot of any systemic conditions is present in the patient and you need a referral or, or a comprehensive evaluation, you need to give a score of four. Okay. The same, and it is important for you to arrange a referral to the healthcare facility, especially if you are uh, doing a national weight survey or if you're doing it as a part of your research. Okay, It's not okay to just go and record the data and come back and just use it for the research and leave it at that. Okay, So some kind of arrangement to the healthcare facility, probably to your college where you're studying or some other nearby clinic, something like that. It would be because you are finding out a disease in a patient and it is your ethical duty to also tell them, even you may not be able to provide all the treatments, but at least you can arrange a referral to the nearest healthcare facility. Okay. Uh, there was slight difference in 97 form because we need, we had, we had want, they wanted us to code it based on whether it was a life-threatening condition or a pain or infection because now it's not, that, that, that did not work out quite well. That is why it has been changed. Okay. So this is how you record the form. Okay. I just went through it quickly because most of the codes are given in the form itself. We don't have to buy heart anything as such. Okay, but by now you'd have understood that we have covered almost all the major dental diseases, right? But why 97 is still used? Because when I start the, started the lecture, I mentioned that 97 is still used because that still uh, people might require the, uh, the malocclusion and they might require the assessment of TMG. That is why uh, it is also there. Some people, what they do is, they kind of adapt both the forms. They customize and where they take TMJ aspect also, and then they use the 2013 form. Okay, so that a little bit of modifications is allowed provided you report that all this has been done. So while reporting the survey, that is imagine that you have done the survey, you have collected all the information, you have done the analysis, and now we are going to report the survey. For reporting, it is said that you need to report the materials and methods, that is in which area did you do it, uh, what was the, how did you collect the information? What was the sampling method? What were the personal and physical arrangements that you made? That is, for example, how did you examine the patient? We had given you certain options, how you can examine that has to be explained. How did you do the analysis? Which software did you use? And was there any cost involved? Okay. All this is for surveys. Okay. If you're doing it as a part of a state or national. Thank you for the and then you need to mention the results in the form of text or using tables and diagrams, then you can write your discussion and conclusion. So if there are postgraduates here who are doing oral health status as your uh, study topic, you need to make sure you need to mention all this in your report. Okay. And finally, you summarize them. You are probably given abstract at the beginning and you give a summary at the end of the study, end of the report. Okay. So uh, what I'm going to do here is, uh, I want to uh, I want to give you some questions or rather certain scenarios. Okay, I know I have not gone into detail of this. That's okay. With whatever you have just put the codings also here, right? I am going to put a poll here, and whatever answers you feel is right, you can uh, choose the answer. It's a multiple choice question, and whatever you feel right, 
you can choose it and we'll see whether that's the correct answer or not and i'll tell you why it is different also if in case you have gone wrong i'll tell you what is the difference okay so dr denzi can we have the first question yes please? Yes, they can sir. answer all of them here, isn't it? Yes, yes, they can answer all of them. Uh, let me know, participants, if you can see the poll. I've just uh, started it. There are a total of six questions. So yeah. one after the other, if, if you've logged in from your mobile phones, you need to complete each question and then go to the next subsequent questions. Probably so, you can give five minutes, four to five minutes. Yeah, we can give them four to five minutes. Yeah. Could someone let me know if uh, it's visible to... Yeah, I can see it. Yeah. Anybody, let us know in the chat box if you could see the first question. Uh, dentition status 2013 scores for the crown and root in case of a normal tooth. There are multiple options there. So we are following the 2013 criteria where you, where you need to code only the crown and the root. Okay. So just for your reference, I've given the the box also in the screen, so you can code there. The first one is for the crown, the second option is for the root. A lot of the students, Dr. Venkat, uh, they have uh, a lot of difficulty probably because uh, they have a notion in mind that you know this is something uh, uh, like rocket science and they get scared with the boxes and, and the tabulations yeah. but then you know it's it's extremely simple it just needs some time and then pondering upon and uh, it, it's simple coding uh, uh, in, in, in a very lucid manner so i think that was the reason uh, a lot of students uh, you know were not that confident enough yeah so i think uh, yeah. Uh, I'm not also sure like how many colleges actually uh, uh, do yes. this as a part of their UG training. Okay, probably we might just take Very a session, good. but we might not ask them to do it in the clinical setup. Due to again, mm -hmm. one thing is when somebody mentioned that it takes time, uh, they mentioned it takes less time. But I mean, it depends on what uh, I mean. Depends on scenario. If you're doing it after your whole case history, again, if you're asked to take this whole performer, it's mm -hmm. definitely going to take a little bit of more time because you need to check each and every box or each and every tooth for your KD status and all that. So, uh, but sometimes you can even write it from your case history. You can sort of fill most of the boxes from the case history itself that you're taking routinely. But we need to understand that this form is actually meant for survey, for survey purposes. Okay, so if you're doing a research or if you're going into the field to do a data collection or you want to assess the oral health burden of a particular community, this is the way to go because it is standardized and uh, i think by now you'd have understood that the coding is not actually very difficult okay mm -hmm. so it's more or less the codes will uh, fluctuate between zero to four or five or maximum and most of the options are also given just adjacent so there's nothing that you need to buy heart actually here okay so in that way i think this would uh, this would help your purpose in case you're doing a research or a survey if you're planning to do a research or a survey Sure. Just adding it to what Dr. Venkat said, uh, this actually forms the fundamental basis for dental epidemiology. Like all that we know, collection of information about the burden of the disease, uh, it in fact gets very important um, as we go up. You know, if, if you get to work in governmental institutions on research projects, you know, uh, these have, need to be one of your core skills and public health dentists, especially for the postgraduates, uh, it's, it's mandated that they really know this very well because the collection of information and dissemination of that is a significant part of, of their profiles. So that again uh, is, is you know, extremely important. And uh, I think after, uh, after the completion of your session, uh, Dr. Venkat, yeah. uh, I had to also uh, give a little bit of information about the universities which are doing this in okay. terms of the global, uh, I wanted to just uh, show the students about uh, the Malmo University and yeah, the Nagata University. Yeah. And, uh, so I think well, once we finish this, so uh, I can see about 18 of the total 80 participants have already voted and uh, we'll just give them some more time. 
Yeah, just to run through the questions. Uh, first question is dentition status, course for crown and root in case of a normal tooth. Then the options are then dentition status course for crown and root in case of a tooth missing due to trauma, which is not replaced. Another question is of, if there's an FPD relation to 3638, 37 was lost due to caries. So dentition status course for that particular thing. So this is actually uh, getting a lot of, I mean, uh, we can see, it's okay if, if you're wrong guys. I mean, it doesn't yeah, matter. Absolutely fine because I have not gone in detail hmm. to, of each criteria that would take a lot of time to actually explain <laughs> each of these, but uh, I can always explain why this answer is like that. Uh, in, even if you go wrong, that's not a problem. You might get one or two wrong. I, I'm expecting one or two questions where you might get confused with the answers, but that's fine. Some issue with your video doc. I think uh, uh, probably the app needs uh, an update or something, I guess. It usually mm -hmm. happens. Yeah. yeah, now I think it's fine. Because uh, I think you, you face that issue in the beginning, right? Like once you switch it on and, and it goes off yeah, by itself. Uh, there's a Zoom bug which is going <laughs> on the routes. <laughs> yeah, I know that because I've... I've, I've I had people face that issue. Uh, I think you can just go for an update yeah. and uh, then that should be fine. I think now it's fine. Yeah, we can see you. Let me just spotlight your video. So I think we shall end it. It's yes. Yeah. Okay. Let me just uh, share the results. Okay. okay. Yeah. So coming to the first question, I think uh, most of you have got it right. Well, the question was scores for crown and root in case of a normal tooth. Okay, uh, I expected this the second and third also answers to come because uh, one thing is sorry the second answer to come because nine is not recorded. Probably you might feel that the tooth is not seen, so that's why you might not record. But there is if you look at it, the option is unexposed root. That is what option eight says. So the root is definitely there inside, but you are not able to see it. That is why we give a score of eight. And the tooth is sound, or rather the crown is sound. There are no problems in that. That is why a score of zero, okay? So I hope that's why you understood what the difference between nine and eight here. Of course, one and eight cannot come because one is the score for caries. We don't have a caries here. And eight and eight might not come because the tooth has already erupted. The crown is visible, but the root is not visible. Okay, so that's why zero eight is the answer. Then coming to the second question for crown and root in case uh, the tooth is missing due to trauma. Okay, if the tooth is missing due to trauma, we cannot give a score of four because it is four says it is missing due to caries. Okay, so missing due to any other reason is what we need to score. That is why the score is five and nine. Okay, uh, again uh, we have not replaced it, so a score of five seven will not actually be applicable here. Then coming to the next question. Okay, so here the percentage is a little bit almost similar the first two options. Yeah, this is something you need to actually take care a little you need to be a little bit more careful when you record if, if there's an FPD or if there's a bridge from 36 to 38 and 37 was lost due to caries. And the question the first question is to see what is the score for 36, which is actually the abutment. Okay, so when you score the abutment, the and uh, you need to score a score of seven okay that is there's no doubt in that why the root is seven is because the root is still there but the root a uh, uh, crown has been kept on top of the root so the who recommends you to put seven there okay and not seven zero because again that is because i have not told you the reasoning behind it it says very clearly they have added a note on, uh, on this particular uh, section where they're explaining the score of seven saying that if the crown has an abutment, the root should also be considered as the same score. But, but if it is a pontic, that is we are talking of three seven, if the three seven was lost due to caries, but it is a pontic. Okay, so if that is the case, they say that 
you need, since there is no natural tooth there you need to consider the crown as missing only that is why the score of 4 is given and since there is no root as such we write we say it as not recorded so 4 9 is the correct option okay it will not be 5 9 because i have told you the reason for loss is due to caries so that is why it is 4 okay then we shall go into to, uh, question number 5 where you have a tooth number 26 with gingival recession and caries in the cervical region of the buccal aspect involving a crown and the part of the root so the difference here is the root is exposed when we say that there is gingival recession the root is exposed so if the root is exposed and if it has caries you can always write the score as 1 for caries and i told you that the caries involves both crown and the root so even crown has to be coded as 1 that is why it is 1 1 okay whereas there is a tooth number 1 6 with gingival recession and an occlusal amalgam restoration okay i have this is the only information i have given you there is no uh, information regarding uh, what do you call any dk in any other aspect of the uh, oral cavity so what would be the answer for this anyone since there's a little bit of confusion here the answer is 30 why zero is because the root is sound the root is exposed but the root is sound i have not given any information as to whether there is any caries or anything in the root i told you there is an occlusal amalgam restoration so the crown status will become filled i have not given you evidence of any secondary caries or anything like that so it is 3 for the crown and 0 for the root Okay, so like I said, it would it will take a little bit of reading, uh, repeated reading twice or thrice for you to get a hang of these codes uh, to perfection. So uh, I just have a few more slides, Doctor Denzi. Just five yes, minutes. Yes, please. I hope it's fine. Sure. Yeah. Please, please. That's okay. So then, uh, this WHO manual in 2013 gives you another form for uh, children. Okay. So again, a few things have been. Uh, changed for children the key difference is that uh, in dentition status you record only the crown you don't record the root surface okay and the coding is in terms of alphabets not like 1 2 3 you would have seen in the picture it's a b c d e that is how you need to record for children and periodontal status of course there's no point in checking for pockets in children so the only option that you need to check here is bleeding and even loss of attachment you don't need to check for children because you don't expect a lot of periodontal destruction to happen in children and of course there is no denture status that is there in the children form so this the children form is only a one page form of which these elements have been removed okay and there are a few other resources that is there in the manual like i said uh, there are two forms for adults and children one form is what we saw now and the other form is for different surfaces like you take dmfs okay where you record each and every surface the surface is there for only dentition status not for any other thing because that is where the heart tissue examination comes into picture so you need to record the occlusal mesial buccal distal and lingual or palatal aspect of the uh, tooth okay so that is there for both adults and children then they also give you a oral health questionnaire for adults and children also in the 2013 manual in case you want to know their brushing practices and uh, any other factors associated with oral hygiene uh, there is a questionnaire you can use and like i said there is a oral manifestation for hiv aids okay in case uh, because i don't think we might require it in for routine use but if you are planning to work on this special group of population there is a special form for HIV AIDS, which gives you some of the oral manifestations of HIV AIDS also, and you need to take them whether that manifestation is there or not. You can have a look at the form in the manual, and they have also given you some standard tables that you could generate from these forms. Okay, because since you collect a lot of information, you might be confused as to what to report and how to report. Okay, so to help you with that, they have given you some standard tables and a few color plates for oral conditions, especially fluorosis and soft tissue. lesions or oral mucosal lesions there are a few indicative pictures not that 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 is the only bit, that is the only way to go go for it there are some indicative pictures which will help you to understand what the conditions are okay so this is the oral health questionnaire for adults okay just a screenshot of that and you have one for ch uh, for children also this will ask tell you about the uh, 
oral hygiene aids that that they use and uh, their oral hygiene habits and their visit to a dentist and all that and uh, any difficulty something like your functional uh, uh, problems that you have during uh, with regard to oral health and uh, any of the nutritional how is your nutrition and how is your diet all those things they kind of uh, check using this they are basically checking for risk factors that is what they are trying to do in this particular form and uh, so where to look for it it's a freely downloadable document the 2013 version and the 97 version it is there in the who website if you just go to google and type who oral health assessment form 2013 it directly take it will give you this first link directly the same with 97 version also uh, you can go it's around uh, 120 pages uh, which gives you explanation for each of the code that i spoke of here okay so it is highly recommended you go back and download this and keep it as a ready reference material and it should be very helpful while you do the survey so that's it uh, thank you thank you all of you for your patient listening and uh, if you have any doubts you may clear it now yes dr venkat so i think uh, that was a very very uh, comprehensive overview session Uh, the whole purpose like i said right in the beginning uh, it's about having uh, you know an overview of of the who you know basic oral health survey performer all right moving on uh, questions uh, i think there is there, there is yeah, a question uh, there is one question yeah karishma is asking uh, box 43 if we consider the condition as normal we give the score zero then what do we write in box 43 zero that's zero 43 44 you meant uh, the extra oral examination isn't it so if the first thing is zero even the second is also zero okay yeah. so participants uh, i think uh, you can put in your question yes i think ipshita wants to ask a question uh, yes dr ipshita go on uh, hello good evening sir yes, so this is ipshita actually i had a doubt sir if yeah. a root canal treated tooth it has a pfm crown then what to write for the crown or root similarly if uh, we are uh, even applying the patient a veneer then also sir what to record for the crown and uh, root score so please can please see uh, the score for the crown is always 7 there is no doubt regarding that okay because okay. the 7 says that any uh, restoration any crowns or veneers for that matter the score that you have to give is Seven. Okay. Yes, But sir. if you are going to, uh, uh, you asked about the root also, right? So if yes, uh, the root is there, then the score that you need to give is, uh, you, it depends on if it is the uh, you said about crown. So the score that you need to give is again seven. Okay. The okay. only difference that comes there is with regard to the pontic. Pontic is the okay. root that is missing. Missing. Yes. That is missing. You need to make sure that the code is not. the score score of 7 rather it is 4 or 5 oh. depending upon the yes. reason why because of which it well, is mm-hmm. yes sir ah uh, yes that i understood i only had doubt for this root canal treated if they have a crown or uh, any veneer if we are giving for anterior teeth then what should be the score so if we, in case of veneer also we will go for both 7 uh, and 7 for crown and root yeah yeah okay sir thank you so much sir We have another question uh, from Surbi. Yeah. Surbi is asking if you're using some part of the 2013 performa, like only the parietal status, CPS status, and oral lesions, mm-hmm. do we have to cut paste the performa for data collection or put the very same analysis? Uh, Except for, spaces. It, it, for definitely for your thesis, you would be preparing a performa for data collection, isn't it? So uh, if you're just using part of the oral health assessment performa it is always good to uh, in your thesis book if you are asking me how do you have to put it means if you are going to put in your thesis book i would recommend to put only those of which you have collected the data that because you might not be using the same form rather you would be uh, customizing the form and making a new form for yourself right instead of taking the whole form and the whole data as such you just take whatever is required make a new form and then you can always say that it is adapted from the who 2013 form because only the following things are required for my objective so i take this and then i report it so don't use the form directly from who make your own form 
and then put the form in the end. Basically using the except. Yes. Yeah. If RCT is in process, like we have not completed the treatment, what do we record? That usually what you record is there is a option for temporary to uh, temporary restoration. So if it is RC is not completed, means that there is temporary restoration. Right. If there is temporary restoration, then you need to uh, give a score of uh, carious tooth restoration, what you should give. That is, it would be uh, a score of uh, one, if that is carious, because the tooth is still not, has been, has not completely been treated. Okay, it's something like what we give for temporary restorations in DMFT. We still count that as DK, isn't it? So, unless it's a permanent restoration, we don't give it as, because tomorrow this thing could again, uh, the temporary could go and still it's a carious tooth. Okay. Okay. Any more questions, guys? Uh, yeah, we have. Uh, asking, uh, what would you recommend to add? Or <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Next WHO basic oral health survey. Hi, sir. Uh, I mean, I'm not very sure, but rather uh, I felt that uh, removing malloc TMJ, I think, should have been included because uh, there's been a renewed interest in TMJ. In the past few years, right, a lot of research is going on in TMJ, and that has become the orofacial pain, as, and a lot of other things have been related to TMJ. So I would like to see TMJ back in this because it's a little bit easier to record. It's not a very difficult thing to record TMJ, unlike the uh, dental aesthetic index for dentofacial anomalies. So probably TMJ is something I'd like to see uh, it back. And from your end, do you have any suggestion <laughs> from your end? You want to include something? Anything, anything from your answer, Dr. Vikrant? Okay. <coughs> okay, uh, any more questions? Meanwhile, uh, I just have a small piece of information to share. Uh, Dr. Venkat, I'll just uh, share my slide and yeah. take them through uh, the information. Now, uh, over the last one hour, uh, students, uh, you'll have been uh, listening to Dr. Venkat, you know, talk about the various components, right? Now, the World Health Organization's uh, main motto of giving out this kind of a performa is basically to give a sound basis for assessing the oral health status, right? And based upon that, also its future needs so that every country might devise that. Now, over the years, there have been a lot of revisions which has been happening and uh, you're sort of, you know, acquainted with that. Uh, what exactly uh, is, is globally, you know, uh, the usefulness of this? Uh, I just like to share my screen and take you to uh, two very important websites. I think uh, that would probably give you an idea on how this is being taken care of. Okay. Now, like Dr. Venkat mentioned, uh, you could always find this on, on the World Health Organization's website. And accordingly, you also have the details. Okay. Uh, are you able to see my uh, screen, guys? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, uh, like I said, a simple Google search would uh, lead you here. Okay. Uh, there's also something known as an oral health country or area profile program. Now, this is just in addition to what happens afterwards, you know, when, when every country conducts these widespread surveys. In fact, in India, it was in 2000 to 2003 that we had a national oral health survey and fluoride mapping. So, this is basically managed by two important universities, you know, which have been instrumental in forming this. One is the uh, Malmo University in Sweden. Okay, now they have their profile project where an oral health and country profile is actually available on their website. So they follow the uh, WHO's Performa, the oral health assessment techniques and tools. And if you click on these various countries, just to give you a perspective, uh, for India, I think you could go in like this and have a look at that. Now, when we go into this, uh, we can see that there's a lot of information which is available. So this is the importance of data, right? Now, a, a lot of students wonder, you know, don't read this as a theoretical aspect. You know, when once you look at this in terms of what is actually happening to information, this is valuable information. And uh, all of this is mentioned in, in this. For example, if I were to, you know, give you the data for, you know, DMFT of primary teeth, it gives you age-wise, you know. So whatever we have is, of course, a very you know, old data, but then yes, once uh, every country conducts this will be updated here and you can notice that there are trends, okay? So I really recommend all of you to please go through this website and, and get a perspective on data and try to find out. And everything which is essentially 
derived from conducting these oral health assessment uh, performers you know bait missing teeth edentulousness or you know the sugar consumption manpower everything is actually mentioned here okay so you are able to understand and and see that you know basically that difference is uh, you know highlighted over here okay now if you go back to uh, the previous uh, slide here you can also notice that there is a periodontal component okay in the periodontal component like i said the nigata university in japan maintains a periodontal component of the oral health database okay now this was last updated in the year 2005 so you have the scores again the cpi index and everything so you can connect the dots and you can see that how you know it goes and and collects so you can access the database which is available here okay so once you enter it here you notice country wise it's everything is is visible here you click on india you are able to notice okay under the cro region so person percentage of persons who have the highest score and and the number of sections recorded all of that okay the reason i i uh, showed this to all of you all is you need to uh, know the why of everything right uh, you know that why you need to find out this data why is it standardized in the first place and and why does who and so many people come together in fact uh, you know if you look at the basic document which is available for free download uh, it, it gives you everything in detail for every single box what is uh, been told to you and probably because most of the dental colleges uh, you know don't teach this or don't practice this or maybe just you know have it as a theory session uh, you don't really get to know the integrities of all these things but then yes again uh, uh, today the reason we we planned this session was you know we wanted to create some awareness about this and get you all to you know get more content into this and treat more of and, and these things all right so uh, any doubts guys uh, quickly i think before we can wind up let's just uh, have a look here okay all right so i think we have a couple of teachers i think we can uh, invite them to come join in on our session here i think we have dr manjunath sir dr manjunath pranik sir i think uh, dr manjunath sir are you there uh, session we could yeah good evening dr dinsi yeah good evening good evening sir <laughs> yes sir so your thoughts on on this uh, topic sir for for post graduates and in fact dr venkat very beautifully presented today's session so yeah excellent presentation uh, dr venkat thoroughly enjoyed your uh, presentation it is a very vast topic but you covered uh, very well uh, i felt like that and also the quiz was very interesting <laughs> a variety of uh, conditions you have put it was very nice Uh, oral health surveys, uh, like when we started, like our post-adjudication days, hmm. we had uh, 1986 pro forma. Lot of improvement came about in 97 and now in 2013. 13 is uh, very nice, very comprehensive. Although they have left out a uh, few important things on malocclusion, similarly opacities, TMJ, but otherwise I think it covers uh, more of uh, subjective aspects. Very nice. Thanks so much, Dr. Densi, Dr. Venkat. Yeah, thank, you, thank you. Thank you. Sir. All the best. Thanks. Thank you, sir. We have uh, Dr. Ramesh also is there, sir. Uh, Ramesh, sir, if you could uh, come online and to share your thoughts on 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 the session. And we have a couple Ramesh. of speeches as well. Good evening. Ah, oh, good evening. Sir. Yes, yes, sir. Please go ahead. Sir. We can hear you. Hello. Yes, sir. Sir, we can hear you. Please go. Please go. Ahead. I'm not able to hear you. Can you hear us now, sir? I think there's a technical lag. Hello. Yes. Oh, we can hear you, sir. <laughs> Meanwhile, uh, I think we also have Doctor. Yeah, I think we have so. Ma'am is still there, I'm sure. Okay. Susan, ma'am was there with us a little while ago. She's still there in the meeting. She can chip in. I think a lot yeah, of sorry. the other. Sorry, Denzi, I could not ah. hear you earlier. Yeah. Yeah, am I audible now? Yes, yes, sir. We can hear you. Yeah, yeah. Good evening, Denzi. Yeah. Good evening. <laughs> it was a good crispy presentation. As I had already told you, that it is uh, very difficult to cover uh, in one hour session. Yes, but whatever was apt, whatever was required, he has just uh, touched upon and he has uh, neatly explained to all the participants. Hmm. Okay, yeah, and uh, mainly 
yes at least the post graduates they should by heart to the codes because when they are conducting the surveys for number of people isn't it then at least they should know that ug level i can understand they are hardly one or two cases they will be recording in their uh, chair side that time if they are referring that's okay but for the pgs i expect that uh, they know they need to know all the codes specifically and a uh, little bit about the training and calibration that one part was missing in that you could have just touched upon that also because uh, that is important too isn't it yes sir absolutely <laughs> ஒரல்ஸ்ஸ்ஸ்ஸ்ஸ்ஸ்ஸ்ஸ்ஸ்ஸ்ஸ்ஸ்ஸ்ஸ்ஸ்ஸ்ஸ்ஸ்ஸ
any other questions anybody else uh, again like i said you can always reach to us and uh, we shall be doing it uh, back to dr venkat uh, uh, yes dr venkat i think uh, closing remarks if you could just uh, give us a, a take home message for the session today yes doctor so uh, so like sir said uh, it is important to actually know this because these are standardized forms right so even if you are not using this in total uh, if you're trying to use it, probably parts of it, it, it is recommended that you use this performer, okay? Because it will enable worthy comparisons. Okay? If there are similar people who have done it in other countries or other communities or other geographic locations, uh, it is, standardization is very important. We might be doing a lot of surveys here and there, but sometimes uh, you might feel that there are differences in the methodology that is being used or the index that is being used and all that. So this particular form would uh, put an end to all those confusions because it is being adopted worldwide. It is not only in India, not only in Asia, but rather it's a worldwide uh, uh, accepted form. So any uh, long, any uh, surveys which are uh, in which where where you are going to involve a lot of participants and they are trying to make worthy comparisons, this is the form to go. Okay. So uh, sorry for being a little bit very quick. Uh, because I had to cover a lot of portions, but this manual will uh, give you in detail. So I would recommend all of you to just go back and have a look at the manual in areas where you have a confusion as to which code to give. That's it, Dr. Denzi. Once again, thank yeah. you. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Looking forward for further programs. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Venkat, uh, when I first uh, Put this across to him and uh, you know he said the mammoth task of uh, doing this uh, in, in, in almost an hour uh, is going to be really a Herculean task so I think I must really commend Dr. Venkert for you know putting things together and and making it very appealing in terms of you know from a UG point of view and also covering uh, the relevant aspects of uh, uh, from a postgraduate since we have a mixed learning group here as well and thank you so much all the teachers uh, who've uh, participated with their inputs uh, because this is something which requires constant revision okay revision in terms of you know for teachers probably uh, we need to look at and critically evaluate various aspects of uh, this WHO performa and uh, different examiners have witnessed you know uh, like Dr. Manjanath sir shared that you know when he was doing his post graduation 1986 so people have witnessed it throughout a, a, a huge period of time but in the end I think we need to take all the good parts together stress on all the important aspects that you know understand that why do we have such a performa and this is I believe uh, very fundamental to our understanding of, in, of public health dentistry as well because uh, without data, without assessing the information, you can't appraise the policy makers and invariably you can't make sense of the data globally as well. So as public health dentists for the postgraduates, uh, like Sir mentioned, make sure you know things you know, by heart and examiners, it's a very, very favorite uh, uh, question in, in your case history in the chair side, as well as in your uh, viva. So look out for questions there as well. And uh, all the resources that are available, we'll, we'll definitely do share the slides also with you. So thank you so much, Dr. Venkarat Salam, uh, for doing this and you know, uh, giving us uh, your time and, and sharing your expertise with all of us. And thank you all, uh, uh, dear teachers and students. We'll see you all very soon, uh, next session and next Wednesday. Uh, we shall be having another important topic, you know, uh, related to the syllabus. And then we'll get back. Uh, thank you all so much. Thank you, Dr. Venkat. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It's okay. Uh, there's a little technical snag and yeah. your, your video <laughs> appears and, and disappears. But never mind. I think that's uh, all right. So see you all very soon. By the way, uh, the recording of this is, is also available on YouTube since we've also live streamed it. So look up, look up. You can always... Uh, Go to a PhD 101 uh, YouTube channel and revisit the video. You know, look at the contents and everything, and you'll also have the reading material. The whole idea of uh, Public Health Dentistry 101 is to, you know, uh, you know, in spite of digitizing the platform, we are humanizing the learning process. So get in touch with teachers, make the most of it, and uh, uh, make sure that your learning journey is, you know, fun and, and 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 a very enjoyable process. Thank you all so much. See you all very soon at the next session. Goodbye and good night. All of you, stay home and stay safe. Thank you.